since the 19th century, as a society, we've really pushed the split of the arts and the sciences away from each other. And while this can be seen as a necessity, as the, the two subjects no longer really overlapped and we became so much more specialised in them, it was a crying shame we pushed them so far away from each other because at the end of the day, when they're brought together, you get some spectacular results. Which is why museums are so special. Because not only do they have to deliver an educational message, unlike other places which can rely on the live animals or mechanical rides, they really have to work with their creativity to draw in an audience. The same experience one can get in front of a painting, such as the execution of Lady Jane Grey, one can also get in front of an exhibit. For example, the Jaguar diorama at the American Museum of Natural History. The emotions it evokes from you, the chance for quiet contemplation, and above all else, the feeling of absolute stunned appreciation as you stand in front of these pieces is absolutely fantastic. So I thought a great place to start to look at this would be the Natural History Museum in London. Uh, it's not the most perfect place in the world, but uh, I've been a learning volunteer there for three years and know it probably a lot better than my own home, which is great if I need to point a visitor in the direction of the dinosaurs or the toilets. Not so much when my flatmates ask me, where's the TV remote? Where's the Hoover? Uh, that's the excuse I've been telling them at least. Um, and not only that, but when you're out there on gallery, there's such a massive variance in the displays that it's really incredible to see how we've changed. So what do we think when someone says a museum? And typically it is this, wall to wall dead animals, thousands of glass eyes staring at you and an inch layer of dust on everything that you're coming out with probably as asthmatic if you weren't before. And yeah, for a while this was the status quo and um, it's a throwback to our predecessors, the Victorians, who would sort of go into the empire, take as much as they could, stuff their houses full of it, or as it started at the time, begin to put things on public. Um, our idea of museums, a lot of it is based actually from those guys. Uh, but the catch was, I use the word public really loosely there, by the way, because it was mainly restricted to the middle and upper classes. And as a result, there was a certain level of academia expected when you walked into these places. So when they walked in, uh, you would understand and know quite a fair bit already about these animals that you looked at. And while that was great back then, it's, you can't get away with it anymore. Fortunately, it's become so much more accessible for everyday public to just go to these places and experience these things. So that's why museums have to really work with creativity to really bring a display that is, people can appreciate, regardless of their background. So what's like a really simple way to do that? Well, you've got skeletons here. How about you add the actual animal next to the skeleton? Seems pretty daft when you think about it. But once you strip the flesh and the fur and the skin away from an animal, the skeleton you're left with can often be really misleading. So that's why having the two next to each other is great, so you can compare and understand what you're looking at. So here's your first bit of forced audience participation for the day. Um, I've got a skull here, and I've just spoiled it for you. It's a Malayan tapia, but check this out. <laughs> Would you have known what that was if you hadn't seen the picture? Be truthful, please. No. That's why having the skull next to the taxidermy is so important, because you can begin to ask some really big biological questions on, and topics, such as comparative anatomy. Tapirs have trunks. Does an elephant skull look similar to this? Or what about extinct animals? Or physiology. So how come we can't see the ears? And why is it so chunky? And where would the muscles come into play? So that's why just that simple bit can really be helpful. Uh, so you have the animal. What about the space it's in as well? Check this out. Absolute chaos, which is brilliant. That's perfect. That's what is all about this particular display. Because it's saying one very important message, which is life is chaotic and just about related to each other. So if you take a closer look, you can see groups of animals have been placed together. Mammals, crustaceans, reptiles, etc. And it just really hammers home that point that about our biodiversity and the world we live in. And it's such a beautiful display. You cannot help but just stare there for hours on end. But not only that, but having a stripped backspace can also deliver a really important message as well. In Paris, there is a gallery that's completely pitch black, bar a couple of spots lights on the specimens. 
All the specimens in there are from extinct or endangered animals. And even though I don't understand French at all, I understood exactly what was happening without having to read the signs. Museums are often the only way we can see so many animals. For example, like our dodo. Heaven help it. So to, don't let it happen to these animals too. And that simple message was delivered so perfectly just in that one gallery. Uh, but just having the animals can only do so much. It doesn't tell you everything about it. And that is where dioramas come into play. The, one, the jaguar one we saw earlier is just as beautiful as these ones here. And dioramas are windows to places we can only wish to go to. There's so much going on in one image. So you have the animals, but what is it eating? What is it doing? How does it live? And so on and so forth. All these questions you can begin to ask and understand. Uh, one particular aspect of biology that these dioramas display so well is actually behaviour. So with behaviour, you're sometimes in the field waiting for hours, days on end to witness something. So when you have a diorama, it's there immediately, completely frozen, to allow you to take as much time as you want to appreciate and look at, what, and look at it. And it's great because it captivates your attention as much as a TV or a radio show can, but without all the fuss. And dioramas are great. It's something we don't have a lot of in the United Kingdom, which is a crying shame. Uh, but what we have a lot of is models. Models are great, particularly for elusive or inaccessible animals like whales. And in particular, the Blue Whale, the Natural History Museum, I feel really demonstrates this point so perfectly. It is common knowledge. The blue whale is the largest animal alive ever, and they can grow up to 30 meters long. We can acknowledge that, but do we actually grasp how big that is? So to put it into perspective, the model here, she's about 27 meters long. The TED letters behind me are seven meters long. So once you start to put four of those together in your head, you get an idea of how big these creatures actually are. And for me particularly, I absolutely love her because she gets the same reaction universal across the board. It doesn't matter what age or what nationality the visitor is. They go in, they see her, and they go, wow. And that's it. Immediately a discussion point is opened. Why is that so surprising? Is this what you expected it to be? And so on and so forth, just from a model. And that's made of wood, just very simple things. So not only is it really important for very animals we may not get the chance to see, but animals we just flat out aren't going to see, such as dinosaurs, AKA the thing your seven-year-old cousin has dragged you to come see at the museum. They're not gonna stop talking about it for the next five hours, which is perfect. Please encourage that absolute excitement in them because please, we love talking about them too. So with models of dinosaurs, so much of what we know is only from fossilized skeletal remains, which, you know, is great. And for someone who studies them, it can tell you an awful lot about the animal. But if you're just walking in there, having been dragged along by your seven-year-old cousin, you might not be able to get a lot just from that skeleton. So having the model, putting the flesh and the bones all together, it just brings them to life. Uh, in particular, these guys are super special because they're animatronics. So they actually move and you can get an idea. Plus, they demonstrate two important things. So if you've recently seen a dinosaur film, you'll notice they don't have a lot of the feathers that these guys do. Even though this is something we know dinosaurs have had for ages, nobody wants to acknowledge it for some reason. I don't get it. I think they're just as terrifying. You know, you have, have you had a chicken come towards you? Scary. They're a lot bigger than you think. All right? So these guys, woof, no way. And, but particularly, particularly for children, this is such an important thing. Don't just get all your information from one source. Go, have a look around. Grab some stuff. Museums, books, TV. Also, they're just a lot of fun to look at, to be honest with you. But in particular, there's one species that museums have been recently using to really engage visitors, and that is the human. Our understanding of what learning is has changed dramatically in the last couple of decades, and fantastically. To go from assuming it's two hours listening to someone talking on end who might throw a book at you if they catch you sleeping, to using so many of your senses and your understanding and trying to get you to think about what you're looking at, not just, you know, not just regurgitating what you're saying. 
that learning is something to love and enjoy. So when you're in a museum, you'll get tour guides, you'll get people giving free talks, you'll get people actually dressing up as historical characters. I've tried for years to get Mary Anning's autograph. I'll do it one day. And of course, volunteers as well. We are there on gallery to not just make sure that you are looking at the displays, but really engaging and enjoying them. And to demonstrate this point, for the front row, I have some even more forced audience participation. Um, so I'd like to give you something. Come on up, num John number one. <laughs> Here you are. So have a feel of that. Pass it around. What do you think? And for the rest of you who cannot hold the thing, here's a picture of it. Not the flowers, although sweet williams are beautiful. Do, do pick some up if you've got the time. So I've just passed around an object. And for the record, don't feel you have to hold it. Uh, but question, what are your first impressions of it? How does it feel? And what kind of shapes can you see? Uh, pointy, smooth, light. Incisors, I'm trying to say. <laughs> chucking, chucking out the terminology. Excellent. So what do you think you're looking at? The jawbone of a meat eater. <laughs> yeah, um, that was pretty spectacular. It is a jawbone of a meat eater. Would you like to pass it along to the other, other half? Is there anything else about this that makes it look like a meat eater's jaw? Or perhaps if I give it some context, uh, this was found in Kenya. Does this give you an idea of what it could be? Human. Hum human. Oof. Mate, you've got to go to the dentist if you've got teeth like that. I'll, I'll tell you that much. Uh, could be, but ancient humans, they've got some weird teeth. Could be something a little more contemporary that you might pay a lot of money to go see. Big cat. Spot on. That is the jawbone from a lion all the way from Kenya. Has anyone here actually touched a uh, lion skull before? That, that's, a, that, that's exactly the amount of hands I was hoping to see, to be honest with you. And that's why this is so special. I've just given you something which you've had no idea about, never seen, never touched, and through a couple of poking and prodding, or questions, as I suppose I meant to call them, uh, and a bit of context, you figured out what that was. And that's what, and that, in my opinion, is the peak of creativity in museums not just simply allowing you to enjoy a really special experience, but to learn something as well and really discover and ask questions and gain a better understanding of the world around you. And in my opinion, above all else, to care about something, something that's really hard to get people to do. And, you know, I cannot tell the amount of times I have been on gallery or other volunteers too, and we've had a surly group of teenagers or adults come along to us, and within five minutes, you, you have them asking tons of questions about the things you have because they are so interested in what they have. They can now relate to what they're looking at. Or a child who will not listen to anything unless it has the word dinosaur in it, now really interested in the plant seeds in front of you. Or what I find particularly special as well, is when you see a parent's face light up as much as the child you're talking to, when you tell them they've got the tooth of the largest known shark ever. And as well, for a visitor who doesn't speak any English and can't read the signs and just is perhaps a little alienated by the whole experience, with a little bit of basic communication, including a bit of pointing and pictures, to be honest with you, you've given them an experience they can take away and start to relate to what they're seeing around you. So. Please, if you go to a museum, take every opportunity you can to just learn as much as possible. Ask questions, touch the stuff on display. Don't barge past children, though. That's the, please don't do that. Uh, but, but above all else, I hope perhaps next time you go to a museum, you'll see actually how alive those dead animals can be. Thank you.